Well, it's time to sit at the table of the Lord. Communion Sunday is our first Sunday of each month. And of course, let's give a couple seconds for everyone to be seated, take their seat at the table. And uh, thank you, sir. Appreciate that. Bible says as often as you do it, you do so in remembrance of me. So we choose our first Sunday of each month corporately, but it's whenever you do it. Right now, our worship team is going to put us in remembrance. Jesus was betrayed. He took the bread. He broke it. He said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. As often as you eat, you do so in remembrance of me. His body truly was broken for us. He suffered for us. He was shamed and despised for us. The joy he endured, the Bible says, laying down his life for those he would call friend. And so when we, we, eat the bread we can we can remember that his body was broken to take away sickness and disease sickness and disease can't lord itself over us on its own terms anymore because of the body of our broken messiah and so we look back to the cross the altar in which the lamb of god was slain Look to where he is now at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you and I, the saints. Look forward to his appearing. 
when he receives his church, but also his coming when we come with him with a sea of angels to set up his earthly kingdom. Let's eat together. covenant blood that never runs out of power <laughs> and that same night in which he was betrayed he took the cup after supper saying this cup is the new covenant new testament new contract new will or those things made new in my blood as often as you drink you do so in remembrance of me and we will eat and drink and proclaim his death until he comes and death was not the end for him was it he's more alive than ever before and he took the keys from death and hell and he had now has authority over them and death no longer has dominion over him and you and I are in him so death no longer has dominion over us as we are in him. Paul talked about an unworthy manner, eating and drinking. Those would be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Eat and drink judgment to themselves. What was that manner? It was divisive. It was self-oriented. It was arrogant. And contrary 
in diametric opposition to Jesus' others-oriented behavior and nature and that which was sacrificial. So we need to examine ourselves. Examine ourselves before we come to the table. Because there are those who, who didn't discern the Lord's body. And, and the Lord's body, that's you and I. Yeah. The unworthy manner that the Corinthians were guilty of is how they treated one another. They treated each other awfully, horribly. That's not the, the, the nature and makeup of a believer. We walk in love. Unconditional love. And, and so if we would judge ourselves, you wouldn't be judged. Let a man examine himself. But when we are judged, we're chastened by the Lord. Thank God for his chastening. Thank God that the judgment for us, his children, is different than the judgment for the world. I'll tell you what, I'm glad I'm in the family of God. Listen, I'm going to tell you right now, I will take a spanking from God any day of the week over the judgment due to those who have rejected him. I'm glad I'm where I am. Are you glad you're where you are? Let's drink together. Hallelujah. Let's stand as we're able. Hallelujah. One accord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you for your blood. resources and power we believers have because the Godhead of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit live on the inside of us. As you recall, this message was prompted by the question raised by Job in Job 6.13, where he asked, is not my help in me or within me? And the exploration of the power and work of the Trinity within us led to a resounding yes to the question posed by Job. Indeed, our help is within us. Now, our study on within dependence led us to conclude that this all-encompassing power within us is represented by the he that is in you that is greater than he that is in the world. You know the statement, he that is within us is greater than he that is in the world. That's 1 John 4.4. 4. Uh, now, the question that several have posed to me and by other believers is how do I tap into this power? How do I realize the power in my life? One person put it this way, just how do I activate this great power that is said to be within me? I'm not quite there yet because I don't feel anything inside of me. Now, let me just say this about feeling. Uh, Elder Nate touched on that. It's by faith that we walk, not by feeling. It's not by sight. It's not by what we hear. It's not what we touch or taste. It's we walk by faith. Faith and feeling are not the same thing. Faith and logic are not the same thing. Because you might say, well, you know, that's not really very logical. Well, we're not talking about logic. We're talking about faith. Different, different animals. Now, the expressed sentiment that I'm not quite there yet reminds me 
of the time the Apostle Paul was under arrest and he appeared before King Agrippa to plead his case. Now turn to Acts 26. If you have your Bibles, you might want to turn there. We're not going to read the whole thing because I'll summarize it for you. But in Acts 26, Paul is brought before King Agrippa. He's been brought before Felix. He's been brought before uh, uh, Felix was a governor. A couple of other people, they didn't know quite what to do with Paul. And then Paul uh, asked to plead his case in Rome because he was a Roman citizen. So no one could really kill a Roman citizen. You could always plead to Caesar. So anyway, along the way, they took him to several people, and they now brought him before King Agrippa. And the, uh, I don't have my Bible open to that point, but uh, anyway, the uh, 26th chapter of Acts, very first verse, King Agrippa says, you are permitted to speak, Paul. So Paul goes through this, what I call, eloquent rendition of his growing up as a righteous Jew, how he did all of the things that a righteous Jew would do in terms of knowing and observing the law. And then uh, he goes on to tell Agrippa, because of his conviction to his religion, he persecuted uh, the people who were followers of what was called the Way, W-A-Y. That's what early Christianity was called. He not only persecuted them, he bound them, had many of them sent to prison. A number of them were killed. And then he tells King Agrippa of the heavenly vision he encountered on the road to Damascus, and all of us know about that, uh, where Jesus appeared to him, declaring, in this case here at Acts 26, 16, he's repeating what Jesus told him. And Jesus says, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness both of the things which you have seen and of things which I will yet reveal to you. See, uh, Jesus had chosen Paul as his chosen vessel to bring the gospel to the Jews and the Gentiles. So Paul got his knowledge directly from Jesus, not secondhand or thirdhand, not from the other apostles or disciples, but directly from Jesus. Paul was told by Jesus that he was to preach, as I said, to both Jew and Gentile, quote, to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. As stated in Acts 28, 18, Paul said, that was stated in Acts 28, 18. So for diligently carrying out this heavenly vision from Jesus, Paul explains to the king that the Jews seized him and made every effort to kill him. And this was on several occasions. As a matter of fact, there was a group that followed Paul around everywhere he was to see if they could get an opportunity to stone him, to kill him, and so forth. But Paul goes on to say that with the help of God, Paul says this in Acts 26, 22, 23, and you have it right in front of you, that he continued to stand to this day, giving witness that Christ would suffer, that he would be the first to rise from the dead, and would proclaim light to the, Jew, to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. And of course, that's what we celebrate it today in communion. After this moving testimony, uh, look at Acts 26, 28. And we hear this from King Agrippa. It says, then King Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. <laughs> and I have a lot of friends like that. <laughs> and some relatives. In the next verse, verse 29, Paul says this, I would to God that not only you, but all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except these chains. And Paul holds up his hands where his hands are bound uh, in chains and so forth, because he's a prisoner. So today I want to explore with you the question that many of you have that prevent you from being altogether persuaded, as Paul was, of the reality of the Trinity living on, side of you, on the inside of you that we've been talking about for 18 sessions. The question is asked, how can I realize or achieve these great things that the word says are mine and that are within me? Stated differently, 
How do these great resources and promises of God become manifest in my everyday world to help me shape and direct my life? Now, there's no question that the word that we teach here every week, Bible study, Sunday service, about our salvation benefits package, God's manifold gifts and promises, his manifold grace made available to us, our right standing with him, and the fact that greater, again, greater is he that is within us than he that is in the world, and so much more. This is absolutely stupendous in scope and grandeur. But let's be honest, for many of us, the reality remains that we are not all luxuriating in the redeeming, restoring, and elevating promises of God's word. This reality brings, to, brings me to my topic today, which is all together by faith. As Apostle Paul uh, Price has taught us, that's Apostle Price, by the way, has taught us down through the years, everything we have been talking about, that's God's love, God's gifts, and God's promises that we find expressed in his word is available to us, to you. But to lay hold to these gifts and promises, you do this by faith. You access them and you receive them by faith, your faith, not anybody else's faith, not your husband's faith, your wife's faith, not your parents' faith, not the minister's faith, your faith. In your faith, you must be almost and altogether persuaded, as was Paul. We are now on page three, if I can get to it. Now, I, I call being all together in faith an imperative to realizing and activating in your life the vast resources that we have been talking about these past many weeks. Being all together in faith is an imperative, and I use the word imperative because imperative means absolutely necessary and urgent. Faith is absolutely necessary, and it's also urgent if you are ever to realize the boundless good that God has already prepared for you from the foundation of the world. That's from the beginning of the world. It's already been done. Everything that we talk about, it's already been done. And you just have to learn how to access this and appropriate it from the spiritual arena into the physical world in which you live. And you do this by faith. You do this by speaking these things into your life. So in a nutshell, you receive and act activate by faith what has already been deposited in you by God. Now, as Apostle Price has said, exercising faith in his word is the way God has planned for his children to receive the benefits made available to them, to them through Christ's redemptive work on Calvary, which we celebrate today in communion. From Apostle Price's teaching, we also know this basic fact. Faith is based on knowledge. And that's knowledge of God's word. That is why I spent the past 18 sessions providing you with knowledge of the word that is given to us in scripture about the Father, about the Son, and about the Holy Spirit at work on the inside of us. And remember, faith comes by hearing, hearing by hearing the word of God. You really can't, it, it, it's actually common sense. You can't have faith in something that you don't know anything about. And so that's why we are a teaching ministry, to teach you the word. And of course, you learn on your own by reading and studying the word. You can have faith in anything that this Bible says that you have. You can stand on that. So what's the problem with the faith that you have had that seems to inhibit you from growing in your life? that seems to inhibit you from this growth and prevents you from being liberated and expanding and, ex and uh, expounding in this faith. To get an answer to this problem, let's look at some fundamentals about faith. Now, you've heard these down through the years from Apostle Price, so I'm going to go through them really quickly, and you have it right there in front of you. The word that we teach in this ministry emphasizes our Christian rights all the time. So what's missing? Why does the word profit or benefit some? Say it may profit and benefit this person, but not the person next to her. Why is that true? Well, Hebrews 4.2 gives us one answer. There it's stated, and you have it right in front of you, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they heard did not profit them, 
not being mixed with faith. Faith by them uh, and those who heard it. So remember this, no matter how great the message, how great the teaching, how great the teacher, how great the information, if the word that is preached and heard by you is not mixed with your faith, it will profit you little or nothing. To mix the word with faith means you must act on what the word says. Faith is acting on what you believe. You hear the word, you believe it, and you act on it. Now, in addition to not mixing the word with faith, your faith can be short-circuited by another major obstacle, which is unbelief. It's a major one. Doubt and unbelief. And by the way, I don't see it here, but let me just say it now. Uh, doubt and unbelief is a spirit. Spirit of doubt and unbelief. And it has to be dealt with. Uh, so, you may recall the story of the father who sought healing for his epileptic son. We find this in Matthew chapter 17, verses 14 and 20. And we're going to read it. I have it there for you. 14 says this, And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, him being Jesus, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, verse 15, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. So Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. Verse 18, And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. 19, he doesn't say this, but I'll add this, sheepishly, then the disciples came to him privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? Now, I'm going to ask you a question right here. How many of you believe that the uh, disciples had the ability and power to cast out? Raise your hand. All of you do. What is that based on? Okay, I don't have it in here, but you can base it on this in particular. Matthew 10, 1. If you have your Bibles, go there. Let me, let me turn there, too. See, they had been given by Jesus to do this. Right in uh, verse 1 of Matthew 10, it says, And when he, Jesus, had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. So they had the power. So why couldn't they cure and heal this epileptic uh, boy. Jesus tells them in verse 20. So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief. So you can have faith. You can even have the ability to do something. But you, for example, you, you might know that you could actually win the 200 meters in the Olympics. You might know that you have the ability to do it. But meaning that you have the actual physical ability to do it. But if you have any doubt unbelief, that's going to inhibit you from winning that race on the day that you need to win. You can't have faith mixed with doubt and unbelief. Faith, that's where you can yawn, John. <laughs> doubt and unbelief will cancel out faith anytime. They cannot uh, coexist. And I'll give you a couple of other examples of unbelief operating uh, we see this in the early ministry of Jesus when he returned to his hometown of Nazareth where the local residents, remember, they questioned how could this carpenter's son, this was a brother of this one and that one and so forth, we saw him running around, he was a kid. How could he possibly know these great things he's teaching in a synagogue because he was teaching in a synagogue there. So they, you know, shrugged him off. They didn't, they didn't believe him. So Matthew 13, 58 says this, now he did not do many mighty works there in his hometown because of their unbelief. Now, we cover this, I cover this in the message either last week or the week before about the Jews had been, who had been led out of captivity but nevertheless did not enter into the promised land. Uh, they had been led out of Egypt by Moses but the great overwhelming majority did not enter into the promised land and into God's rest. And Apostle Paul comments on this in Hebrews 3.19. So he says, so we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. 
Faith and unbelief cannot coexist as I see it. Unbelief will cancel out your faith. Now, we also know from Apostle Price's teaching that faith is a lifestyle. It should be the way we live 24-7. That is, all the time. In Romans 1.17, we are told, For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. So how many hours in the day do you live? So that means it's the way you live all the time. And I like what Habakkuk says. Aren't you glad you don't have to find Habakkuk this morning? <laughs> Habakkuk 2.4 puts it this way. And I think this is more pointed. But the just shall live by his faith. So faith is indeed a lifestyle, the powerful way of living. So at the bottom of the page, some believers may say at this point, I try to mix my faith or apply faith to my life experiences, but I just don't seem to have enough faith to make things happen. I need more faith. Have you heard people say that? Yes. I need more faith. The apostles came to Jesus in Luke 17, 5, and said to Jesus, Lord, increase our faith. So do you need an increase in the amount of faith you have? How many think that they need an increase? So then you shouldn't have any problems. But we do look at people like Apostle Price and some other national figures and leaders in the religious, spiritual arena, and it does appear that some of them may have more faith than we do, or than other Christians. But go with me to Romans, and you have it right there, Romans 12, 3, where you find this, and this is so important, and this is how you can respond to people who say they don't have enough faith or whatever. Romans 12, 3 says this, For I say, through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one the measure of faith. And I put in parenthesis, not a measure of faith. At salvation, all of us receive the same measure of faith. Now, the original King James Version says, the measure of faith. The New King James Version says, a measure of faith. And as I state here, sometimes in its rendering of the Bible, the New King James uh, treatment of certain scriptures is not always the best. Because it says, a measure of faith. What's wrong with a measure of faith? Because it could be any number of different quantities. It could be an ounce, it could be a pound, it could be a quart, or it could be an ocean full, you know, for the favorites, you know, the apostle prices and the others and so forth. That would show that God is a respecter of persons. I have to remember not to turn away from this. But God is a respecter of persons, which he is not. We have all been given the measure of faith. Now, the degree of effectiveness that faith works to make manifest the things of God in our life depends on how and whether we develop the measure of faith that has been given to us. Faith is like a human muscle. I'm exercising right now to develop more muscle here. <laughs> Because some of you said, you look so skinny. Faith is just like that human muscle. You have to exercise it. If you want bigger biceps, you have to exercise. You have to put your faith into practice. In other words, use it. And no one puts this better and more simply than Henry Drummond, and I quoted him to you before. He's a Scottish minister and author of The Greatest Thing in the World. The Greatest Thing in the World he's referring to. This is his analysis of uh, Paul's essay on love, where love is the greatest thing. Anyway, Drummond writes this. He says, what makes a man a good cricket player? And remember, he wrote this about 100 years ago when he was Scottish. Practice, what makes a man a good artist, a good sculptor, a good musician? Practice, what makes a man a good linguist, a good sonographer? Practice, in those days, the men were the clerks and secretaries. What makes a man a good man? Practice, nothing else. He goes on to say this, there's nothing capricious about religion, meaning it's no different than these things in the physical world. We do not get the soul in different ways under different laws from those in which we get the body and the mind. If a man does not exercise his arm, he develops no bicep muscle. And if a man does not exercise his soul, he acquires no muscle in his soul, no strength of character, no vigor of moral fiber, nor beauty or spiritual growth. But you have to practice your faith. You have to exercise it. So the secret to elevating your level of faith, if you want to call it a secret, 
is in the exercise or the use or application that you make of your faith. Again, look into Apostle Price, the godfather of faith. We have a good example from which to learn. And remember what the scripture tells us about learning from those who set good examples. And I give it to you there in Hebrews 6.12. It tells us that, it says that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Now here's some background on Apostle Price that you may or may not remember. As you know, he is my brother-in-law, and I actually got to know Fred Price uh, the year before when he was dating my sister, Betty. So I knew him before he got saved and before he became a minister of the gospel. The night he accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior in a tent revival meeting in Los Angeles, I was there along with other relatives. Uh, that's the night that he received the measure of faith, the night and time that he received salvation. The day and time when we experience salvation is also the point when we each receive the measure of faith. Fred Price did not get any more faith at his point of salvation than we get at our point of salvation. So what makes his life of faith so much more elevated than what most of us seem to be experiencing in our life? It goes back to what Henry Drummond just said that I read to you, and he wrote this over 100 years ago, practice, use, exercise, application. Faith is acting on your belief. Now, Apostle Price did not start out uh, this way. Uh, in fact, and I was there during the first 17 years as a minister of the gospel, and he even served as assistant pastor in several major churches in Los Angeles. He saw little or no elevation of his faith or his quality of life. In fact, for many of the early years of his ministry, I'm not sure Apostle Price even knew he had been dealt the measure of faith or any measure. I don't think he knew much about faith uh, at this point. It was not until 17 years into his ministry when he came into a real understanding of faith and the importance, and this is important, of the baptism uh, in the Holy Spirit with the speaking in his prayer language of tongues that things began to change for him. 17 years as a minister of the gospel. He not only, he re, actually he did go somewhere. He went backwards in those 17 years. I, I, I was there. I mean, you've heard, he's told these stories. He went bankrupt. I can remember coming home. I was, I think, a freshman in college, uh, maybe a sophomore, coming uh, over to visit them. And I walked in the house, and I thought they had been robbed. <laughs> Everything was gone. Because in those days, if you didn't pay for an appliance, they would pick them up. He had a beautiful set of Encyclopedia Britannica. They were beautiful. I used to use them for research. Gone. They picked them up and so forth. And they've repossessed his car. He even had to declare bankruptcy. Remind, remember, now at this point, he had been a minister of the gospel for 13 to 15 years and so forth. So uh, it was not until 17 years into his ministry that he came into a real understanding of faith, as I said. And found the missing ingredient. A lot of you have bought his little book, The Missing Ingredient, which is the Holy Spirit, and so forth. So let's go back to Hebrews 6.12, at the bottom of the page of page 6, where we are told that through faith and, and patience, we might inherit the promises. Now, Apostle Price did not have much faith during those 17 years, because he didn't really know what it was. But I was there. He did have the patience. Patience meaning endurance, perseverance. He knew that there was more to the Christian life than what he was experiencing, so he never gave up. And there were so many opportunities for him to give, give up. As I said, I saw him go through bankruptcy. I saw him go through the death, the accidental death of his first son. Brilliant, the, uh, little, the first Frederick. Smart, smart, he was really a precocious child. And he was coming home from school one day, and he stepped out because he heard that when the light changes, you go. But the cars don't always stop exactly when the car. And the car came and hit him, and he was killed. But in spite of all of this, Apostle never turned his back on God, and he kept searching. So when he came to a deeper understanding of faith and how faith works, to use the title from his classic book on faith, 
the upward climb in his life never, never stopped and is still continuing to this day. Now, this is important. His practice of faith was incremental. He did it step by step. For example, he started to tithe at the 10% level and never stopped. And today, he and Dr. Betty tithe at around, around 45 to 47% of their income. Remember, faith is acting on what you believe. Dr. Price believed in tithing and the fact that he would receive a corresponding return on his giving. He believed that. By faith, he acted on that belief by beginning to tithe. Uh, and he started with 10%. Now, when he tells the story, he'll tell you this. He could make it on 100% of the income he was taking in at that time. So how could he possibly make it on 90% on 10% less? But he stepped out in faith. He was acting on the relief. He started, and he, from that day, he never stopped to this point. So he and Dr. Betty, and, and I say it in this line, if you continue reading, that he actually gave his way, literally gave his way out of debt. He gave his way out of debt and on to real prosperity. He and Dr. Betty started using their faith on other things, such as pain and illness. They started with a general headache. And I remember I was, I think I was working at that time in New York. Uh, this was about 1970, 71. I was uh, vice president of a company here in New York. And I remember going home to visit them in LA. And I guess I hadn't uh, taken in enough water. I had a horrible headache from the flight. So I went by the house and I said, I have a headache. And Dr. Betty immediately came over to me and said, you don't have to put up with that. It's the first time I had heard that. She laid hands on me and prayed, the headache went, and so forth. And so they started on little things like the headache. And then, of course, you remember the famous lump, which I believe was cancerous in his chest, that he stood on until it disappeared one day. And of course, Dr. Betty's challenge with cancer, and of course, his more recent severe challenge with this debilitating kidney attack that he defeated got up from and continued his ministry. So in developing our faith, Apostle has advised us to start incrementally. Start with small things first. In other words, he says, believe for $100 before you believe for $1,000. But you have to start. You have to exercise your faith to see it grow in strength. Development of your faith is progressive, meaning it's incremental. It happens in stages. It may start small, but it can grow to an limitless capacity. Jesus gives us an example of progressive growth in the parable of the growing seed in Mark 4.28, and you've heard this before, he, where he says, Jesus is speaking, for the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, time, then the head, more time, and then after that, then the full grain in the head. In other words, you don't put the seed in the ground and then come out the next day and you have the full growth right there. So while the earth will yield the crop, we have a responsibility to help promote the growth of the grain by watering it and by cultivating it. While faith, like grain, is planted in us at salvation, we have to water it, to nourish it, and cultivate it by our practice, by our use, by our exercise of that grain of faith, by acting on the word of God in which we, in which we believe. Go back to Luke 17.5, where the apostle asked, and it's at the bottom of your page, page seven, where Je the, the apostles asked Jesus to increase their faith. And this is what Jesus tells them in verse six. He says, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to the mulberry tree, be pulled up by the root and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. Now, I, I cite this to, to show you this, that Jesus is talking about the measurement of faith. He says that if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, I don't know if you've ever seen a mustard seed, but that's extremely small. You can accomplish miraculous things, but you have to use that faith, that faith even if it's small. Uh, this is one of the important contributions of Apostle Price to the body of Christ. He teaches the basics and the fundamentals. And you've had other people say, and even some members say, well, why does he always stay on the fundamentals uh, uh, and, and not move on to something else? I mean. You know, there's great teaching about grace today, and there's great teaching about the blessing, and all of these things are important. He says he's, he stays on the fundamentals because he looks out at the congregation, and he knows that 
boy, a good number of you have not gotten the basics. But this is what I want to tell you. Just like that little grain of mustard seed, if you grab hold to a small quantity of this truth, you can do miraculous things with it. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to go all the way. You know the, 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 the woman with the issue of blood? Uh, you know, that's used to illustrate a number of things, but I use it to illustrate this point that coincides with this. She grabbed the hem of his garment and she was made whole. Now, can you imagine if she had grabbed him around the waist? She would have been blown into the next city or the next town. My point is, is that if you grab hold to the hem of this absolute truth of God's word, you can have an incredible, victorious, overcoming life. You don't have to go all the way, whatever you may think that is. So start incrementally. Now, returning to my opening statement about the tremendous spiritual capacity we have within us, I'm in the second paragraph on page eight. The point I made then, and I want to repeat now, is that we have all received all of these things by faith. In my message on within dependence, I cited Colossians 1, 26, 27, which refers to the mystery hidden for ages and generations. And you might even say from ages and generations, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, how is Christ in you? Paul tells us this in Ephesians 3, 17. He says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Your heart being your spiritual heart, the self within your innermost being. Christ dwells there by faith. God and the Holy Spirit are also within you by faith. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20 says, and I cited this so many times during those 18 uh, lessons, or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? I also cited 1 John 5, 7, you have that right before you, which reads, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Word is the Son, by the way, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. This shows us that we have the complete Godhead, the complete Trinity within us as our source and help all the time for every need. Because of this great power within us, we are victorious overcomers. This fact is affirmed again for us in 1 John 4.4, 4, which reads, and you know this by heart, you are of God little children and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. That he represents the Trinity. Of course it's greater than the he that's in the world. Nothing is greater than God the Father and the Holy Spirit. Now, but what I want you to notice in 1 John 4, 4 is this. It says you have overcome them. This is important because it affirms for us the time dimension that faith operates in. You are not going to overcome them. You have already overcome them. Mm -hmm. By faith, you've already overcome them. Remember Hebrews 11, 1, which says now faith is, and it goes on to tell you, uh, it gives you a description of what faith is. But my point is this. Just look at those three words. Now faith is. Just turn it around. Faith is now. The only time faith is, is now. You can never say, I'm just praying that God is going to heal me. You're not going to get that prayer answered. You have to stand on the belief in the word that you're already healed. By his stripes, you were healed. You are healed. Uh... And that's for all the promises of God. If you, and, and I didn't list them in this message, but you can go down through and it. Everything is already passing. You have been redeemed. You have this. You have been given all things pertaining to life and godliness. You've been given all these things already. Uh, so it's not that you're going to get them. You have them already. And you, again, appropriate them by faith. Uh, so as a believer, you're not going to receive the things of God. By faith, you already have them. And uh, just by way of comfort, I, I, I tossed in Ephesians 3.20, which says, 
Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. That's that power that we've been talking about that works in us. You activate that power that works in you by your faith. That power that works in you by faith is the power of God working on your behalf. But again, the activator of this power is your faith. It cannot be done without faith. That is why we're told, we're at the top of page 9, isn't this easy? I could have just given these to you and we could have dismissed the... Uh... <laughs> so that's why we're told in Hebrews 11.6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him, him being God. So let me add this. This is Minister Scott. I should have put my name there. Without faith, it's not only impossible to please God, but without faith, it's impossible to use God to tap into that inexhaustible reserve of power and resources that are all ready to operate in you on your behalf. So the faith that is necessary for us to live a victorious, overcoming life has to be developed, used, and exercised. As Apostle Price puts it, it is a 24-7, 365 proposition. In other words, we live by faith. And we've already, this is a quick review, we already cited Romans 1.17 that tells us that the just shall live by faith, and Abaca 2.4, that the just shall live by his faith. But before we end this brief discussion on faith, let me stress the important fact, and this is important for you to know this, faith is a law. Faith is a law, just like gravity is a law. Look at Romans 3.27, and you have it right there. Are you there? Yes. Which states, where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? No, but by the law of faith. So just as we walk, and the natural law of gravity keeps us from falling on our face, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, we walk by faith and not by sight, and this faith lifts us up and elevates us to greater heights and keeps us from failing. So we strengthen our faith, as I said, by practice and by adding to this faith the qualities that are listed in 2 Peter 1, 5, 7. And I, I, I listed here so you can have it here. And it says, by, but also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control. What does self-control mean? <laughs> you know what self-control means? It means control of self. It means that mommy and daddy don't have to do it, I do it for myself. You got that, don't you? To self-control, perseverance. Perseverance is endurance, the endurance that I was talking about that Apostle Price had. To perseverance, godliness. To godliness, brotherly kindness. To brotherly kindness, love. You add these to your faith. and But look what it tells you that will happen if you add these things to your faith. Look at 2 Peter 1.10, which is at the bottom of the page. It says, therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, that is, if you add these things to your faith that I enumerated uh, up above, you will never stumble. In other words, if you add these qualities given above to your faith, you will not only not fall, you won't even stumble. I put this down here because I knew nobody was going to do it. I said, this is shouting you. In other words, if you do this, you won't even stumble. You won't even stumble. That's pretty fail-proof. Now, in activating, we're on, on page 10, in activating and applying our faith, we can learn something that was introduced into American thought by William James. William James was a Harvard psychologist and philosopher who is considered the founder of American psychology. In terms of believing and having faith for something, William James said, act as if. These three little words became part of our religious teaching and certainly part of the motivational lexicon. In other words, act as if the word of God is true. Act as if you cannot fail. Act as if your healing is already manifested. Act as if your finances are, are in order and you have an abundance for every good work. Act as if and say or confess. 
it is so, and it will materialize on a physical plane. Now, Apostle Price, when he got an understanding of faith and the fact that he could stand on the word and act on it, he started going around his house saying verbally, audibly, I am rich, I am rich, I am rich. And I remember the kids, they were still pretty young then. They thought he was crazy <laughs> because they looked around the house. The drapes were tattered. They had things that needed repairing, and they needed other things and, uh, that, 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 that needed to be purchased. But guess what? He was confessing, I am rich, but he was doing what he needed to do in the natural. Can you see what he was doing? He stopped spending. So you can't go around and say, I am rich and all my needs are met and all my debts are paid and you're constantly running up to charge cards. So you have to, that's where, now that's where logic and sanity comes in. You can mix that with faith and so forth. So in other words, act as if you cannot fail. Uh, act as if everything is already manifested. So, and remember these four steps to bringing to fruition things in your life. And I put them in here so you would have them at your ready hand. Uh, one, visualize your goal. This is your conceiving it in your mind. Two, internalize your goal. This is a speaking, I mean, this is a believing in your heart. Verbalize your goal. This is a speaking and confessing it with your mouth. All three of those are important to bring you to number four, where it materializes. This is you seeing your goal manifested in your life. Amen. As you go through the four steps to achievement, you can also fortify yourself by acting as if the goal is already achieved, as William James recommends. Amen. This visualization of the end goal is also scriptural. And I, you know, at the last minute, I said, let me put this in so you see that this is actually scriptural. Isaiah 46.10 says that God declares the end from the beginning. Now you need to go there and read 9 and 10 because 9 says, I am God and there's none other like me declaring the end from the beginning. God always sees the end at the beginning. So can we. In other words, if your end goal is to get a doctorate or to be supervisor or to make 100,000, you see that as the end goal. Put it up somewhere. You know, put it on, the, on your refrigerator. And that's your goal. And, 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 and then you go back from there and you do the things that, that, but you visualize your end goal. Now, let me just say this about uh, William James. He was not an unbelieving man of science. He had and acknowledged his own encounter with what he called the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he writes about this in his book, The Varieties of Religious Experience, published in 1902. That's when I first read it. <laughs> now, I just said that to see if you were still asleep. <laughs> so, in our exercise and application of faith, we need to review and remember these basic points. And I put them in there so you could have them. Right. One, faith is based on knowledge, knowledge of God's word. That is why God tells in, in us in Hosea 4, 6, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Faith comes by hearing hearing by the word of God, as we're told in Romans 10, 17. The word of God we hear must be mixed with faith for it to be profitable. For unbelief will cancel out your faith. Faith and unbelief cannot coexist. And we're on the last page. Every believer has been given the measure of faith. Our measure of faith will grow and increase only by use and practice. Seven, our faith grows progressively as we use and practice it. Eight, our faith will never rise above the level of our confession. In other words, it will never rise above what you say, what you confess about the situation. You have to speak it. Uh, and uh, that's very important. So instead of saying how bad you feel, say I am whole, well, and wonderful, and all is well with me, and so forth. So nine, the just shall live by faith, by his faith, Faith is a lifestyle. Ten, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Eleven, and this is, was the subject of those 18 messages, the full Godhead of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit lives on the inside of us, and we receive all the resources and power of this reality all together by faith. Finally, as we use and diligently apply our faith, hopefully we can come to the point 
where we can say as Paul says in Galatians 2.20, and if you were in Nadine Parker's uh, discipleship training class, she read this to us this morning. Galatians 2.20 says this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So we live by faith. Faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave himself for us. We have all been given the measure of faith. If we want to achieve that victorious overcoming life, walk in God's promises, and be truly within dependent, we have to develop that faith by using it and by putting it into practice. And as we go through everyday life, we must walk all together by faith. Thanks for joining us. Our hope is that you received something that you can apply to your life and strengthen your faith. At Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, we believe that the Word of God is practical for everyday application. If you'd like to support the ministry with your tithe and offering, you can mail them to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. We also offer the convenience of mobile and online giving. It's safe and secure. Try it now. From your smartphone, simply text East G to 28950 and follow the prompts. You can even specify a designation for your gift. Text East G for general donation, East T for tithe, East O for offering, or East AL to donate to the Apostles Library. Each transaction needs to be its own individual text message. You can also visit our website, CrenshawChristianCenterEast.org, and click the Give tab to begin your experience. Set up recurring donations or give one-time gifts. This giving method is easy to use, safe and secure, and requires a one-time registration only. After your first gift, giving will be completely simple. Simply text East G to 28950 with your information securely stored. We appreciate your continued support and stand in agreement with you for the manifold return on your life. Thanks again for watching. And remember, we walk by faith, not by sight. We would like you, our viewers and partners, to join us in honoring the legacy of the Apostle by making a donation to the Apostle Frederick K.C. Price Library. The library will be on the grounds of the Faith Dome in Los Angeles, California, and it will be open to the public. It will be a place of study, learning, and research, available for anyone desiring to further their knowledge and understanding of the Christian faith. Visitors will also have a chance to learn more about our founder and his impact on the body of Christ and the world at large. You can mail your donations to Crenshaw Christian Center, New York, 450 7th Avenue, Suite 2111, New York, New York, 10123. If you are giving by check, be sure to designate in the memo area, Apostles Library. If you have Crenshaw Christian Center envelopes, you can mark AL on the envelope. You can also donate via your smartphone by texting East AL to 28950 and follow the prompts. We thank you in advance for your support. And as always, we stand in agreement for the manifold return in your life.